The LA Kings earn a split in Florida as their six-game road trip winds down. The Kings' penalty kill was amazing against the Panthers, but Jonathan Quick's struggles continued against the Lightning. We'll talk about all that and more on this edition of Locked on LA Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Kings fans, welcome to Locked On LA Kings, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On LA Kings your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying this content. We start a new week with 1,164 subscribers. If you're new to the YouTube channel, we have a goal of getting 100 new subscribers each month, and uh, we've been really good at meeting those goals. And it's the second to last day of January, so going to go ahead and hit the reset button on that and see if we can keep that streak going of 100 new subscribers every month. Thank you to all of you who have taken the time to subscribe in the past, uh, and thank you to all those who will take the time to subscribe now uh, and in the future. I'm Eddie Garcia. I am your host of Locked on LA Kings. I've worked in sports media for the past 30 years, 20 plus years at the Fox Sports Radio Network, also co-host of the Puck Podcast. It's a weekly NHL review show that's been putting out content for the past 16 years, and of course, a passionate LA Kings fan for the past 30 years. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Hope you had a good weekend. The Kings played games five, or excuse me, four and five of their six-game road trip. Uh, it started on Friday in Sunrise, Florida, the site of this year's NHL All-Star Game, and continued on Saturday in Tampa against the Lightning. We're going to give you a quick recap of both games, uh, just in case maybe you, you didn't get to see the games because you had a busy weekend. But against the Panthers, uh, we had one lineup change to tell you about from the previous two games, and that was back on the blue line with veteran Alex Edler giving the game off to get some rest, and Tobias Bjornfoot would take his spot. It was reported on Friday on our show from the Kings insider Zach Dooley that Phoenix Copley would get the start in net for the Kings against the Panthers, and that is, in fact, what would be the case. Uh, the Kings would jump out to a 2-0 lead in the first period on goals from Andre Kopitar and Adrian Kempe, who scored shorthanded. L.A. would extend the lead to 3-0 on another shorthanded goal, this one by Victor Arvidsson. But Florida would bounce back with a pair of goals to make it 3-2 after two periods. Late in the third period, Matt Roy would add an empty net goal, which looked to ice the game. But the Panthers would score 34 seconds left in the game to make it a little bit closer. But in the end, the Kings would skate off for a 4-3 victory. The Kings were outshot for one of the few times this season, 48-33. to But the fact that Florida had six power plays certainly contributed to that fact. Uh, the Kings actually outhit a team, which is something they don't do much in the season. The Kings had 17 hits to the Panthers. 14. The very next night, the Kings were back at it, taking on a very hot uh, and formidable Tampa Bay Lightning team. Jonathan Quick would be in net in this one. Alex Edler would be back on the blue line. Tob Tobias Bjornfoot would be out. And Brendan Lemieux was in the game. Uh, and Alex Turcotte would be out on the fourth line, maybe with a Corey Perry on the ice. They wanted to get a little more grit in the game with Brendan Lemieux. But you also would have thought if that was the case, they would have done it against Florida as well because of Matthew Kuchuk. Regardless, things did not start off as well in Tampa as they did in Sunrise, Florida the night before with the Lightning jumping out to a 2-0 lead, which the Kings did to the Panthers. But Jarrett Anderson Dolan would score to make it 2-1. However, the Lightning would respond and LA was down 3-1. After one period, second period, Tampa Bay made it 4-1 to one before Philip Deneau would score to make it 4-2. Only goal in the third period was from the Lightning, and the Kings would lose 5-2. to two. So, what was the good and what was the bad from their two games in the Sunshine State? We'll start with the good, and that was the Kings' penalty kill, which continues to improve the game against the Panthers. Not only did the Kings kill off six Florida power plays, but they scored two shorthanded goals. It's the first time that the Kings have scored two shorthanded goals in a game since 2018. Uh, L.A. even went two for two on the penalty kill against the Lightning, who have one of the top power plays in the NHL. So the penalty kill from the last two games for the Kings continuing to improve. Uh, the Kings' top line was very good against the Florida Panthers. Anche Kopitar had a goal. Quinton Byfield and Adrian Kempe getting assists on the Kopitar goal. Adrian Kempe had one of the shorthanded goals as well. 
uh, for Kopitar. It was uh, his 40th point of the season, 17 consecutive seasons. Andre Kopitar has had 40 points or more. Only Alexander Ovechkin, the only other active player who has accomplished that feat. And for Adrian Kempe, he scored his team-leading 20th goal of the year with that short 100 goal against the Panthers. And it is the second consecutive season that Kempe has been a 20-goal scorer. Also good for the Kings in the game against the Panthers was Phoenix Copley. Uh, a career-high 45 saves on 48 shots in that game. And we mentioned a lot of power play opportunities uh, for the Panthers as well. They say your goaltender is your top penalty killer, and certainly Phoenix Copley deserves his share of praise in the win over the Panthers. Uh, Phoenix Copley now 15-3 and on the season for the LA Kings. Up next, we'll talk about some bad things, and unfortunately, that would include Jonathan Quick, and that is coming up in just a second. But first, I need to remind you that today's episode of Locked on LA Kings is brought to you by Athletic Greens. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you are absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar, costs you less than $3 a day, and it's just one scoop and a cup of water. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. That's athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So LA Kings goalie Jonathan Quick took the loss against Tampa Bay, and there is no shame in losing to one of the top teams in the NHL, a team that's been one of the top teams over the past few years, two-time Stanley Cup winners, three consecutive trips to the finals. Uh, the Lightning's win over the Kings, by the way, was their team record 12th straight at home. So not only are they a good team, but they've been killing it on home ice of late. Two of the goals that Quick allowed, he got screened. One of them was by teammate Kevin Fiala. There was a turnover behind the net that turned into a Kings goal. There was also one where Jonathan Quick was way out of his net, out of position, where they scored as well. He ended up allowing five goals on 25 shots to extend his losing streak to a career high eight in a row. He has not won a game since December the 1st against Arizona. Um, one of those losses was an overtime loss. The Kings got a point out of one of those losses was a shootout loss that the Kings got a point out of. So um, still, though, things obviously aren't going well for Jonathan Quick. Uh, he's allowing almost four goals a game over that span. And um, I have said I would not have started Jonathan Quick against the Lightning. Um, I would have had Quick go against the Panthers and Phoenix Copley against the Lightning. I'm not sure why this seems to be an issue. Um, it's happened a couple of times this season where it seemed obvious that you start your number two goalie against the lesser of two opponents on back-to-back -back nights and your number one goalie against the better of the two teams. I, it just seems uh, too simple to me to not do those types of things. Now, having said that, had head coach Todd McClellan employed my philosophy um, maybe the Kings go 0-2. Maybe Jonathan Quick loses to the Panthers and Phoenix Copley loses to the Lightning. That's possible. Um, but like I said, it just seems it seemed like a bad idea going in. If you're going to have back-to-back -back games to pick the struggling goalie to go against the hottest team in, in the league right now or one of the hottest teams in the league. So um, maybe the head coach didn't do Jonathan Quick any favors. Of course, the flip side of that is if Jonathan Quick beats the Lightning and snaps their what at the time was going into it, an 11-game home ice winning streak, then that's something big to build on. So maybe he's looking bigger picture than just the one game against Tampa Bay. It's certainly possible, but like I said, I, I to me, it's, uh, you know, what is it? Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, let's just not outthink ourselves with this. Let's, you know, we want to get the two points as, as much as possible and put ourselves in a position to get those two points. I think it just makes sense. Again, when you have a back-to-back uh, -back games to play your number two guy against the lesser of the two teams, unless there's some circumstance or statistic that I don't know about, but I, I again, it really hasn't been the case. So we're still looking, obviously, for Jonathan Quick to get a big win, to get him off the schneid. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to think, and I know hockey players are really good at compartmentalizing, and, you know, going shift to shift, going game to game and not letting things kind of string along. But they're also human beings. 
and they have to know Jonathan Quick is on a losing skid. Is that affecting their confidence and the way they play in front of him? Is it, you know, what is it a chicken or the egg thing? Are they playing? Are they not playing well in front of him because he's not playing well or vice versa? It clearly it's a team thing. It's not, it's not a hundred percent on Jonathan Quick, but again, it's obviously a concern for everybody for uh, in many different ways from the from the small picture to needing a number two goalie to play well to help to try and get points in a playoff race when your number one needs a night off. And then the big picture of Jonathan Quick's Hall of Fame career, one of the most beloved players in Kings history, final year of his contract. You want it to end on a better note than it is at the moment, but so far it is what it is. Jonathan Quick has lost eight consecutive games. Now he's going to have some more opportunities going forward. The Kings have back-to-back games coming up on January the 17th and the 18th. The first game is in Anaheim. The second game is back home against Arizona. And then the following week, back-to-back road games. Uh, first one's in New Jersey against the Devils. Second one in New York against the Islanders. So we're going to see Jonathan Quick, barring some something very unforeseen, in two of those games. So there will be opportunities for Jonathan Quick going forward. Hopefully he can just get that one win, get that streak broken, and kind of go from there. But like I said, obviously it's a concern for everybody. Um, the good news is that the Kings are, as a team, playing well, despite Jonathan Quick being in this slump, despite the team not playing as well in front of him necessarily as they have perhaps in front of Phoenix Copley. So that's the good news because if this were a Kings team that were teetering on the brink, you know, let's say they're three or four points out of a playoff spot as we go into the All-Star break, then you're thinking every point is precious. And you could argue that is the case anyway. But if they were in a position where, man, every every game is so important on night to night, you got to get into a playoff spot, then that those starts by Jonathan Quick would be magnified and be even bigger. Right now, they're not. Hopefully, that continues to be the case. But, um, you know, it, it is tough to see the greatest goalie in Kings history going through this right now. Keep our fingers crossed that uh, he can somehow get out of this. We mentioned it. It's got to be difficult. He's never been in this position before to try and work out of a big slump like this when you're not getting the starts. You can't, you know, it, it's, 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 I would think it's much easier to work your way out of a slump if you're in net, but he's only getting a start here and there. So that's got to make it even more difficult. He's got to do it in practice. Um, and hopefully the team can start playing a little bit better in front of him. You would think they would as far as just, God, we got to win one for quickie. We got to even, man, maybe they're pressing. Maybe that's part of the problem. I don't know. But again, an eight game losing streak, any way you slice it is bad. And we're, uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that this thing gets turned around sooner rather than later. Want to mention Quentin Byfield as he continues to be a player in the spotlight for the Kings. Um, I don't want to nitpick everything that he does, but I feel like if I'm watching him and I have something to say about him, then I need to say it. And he did have a great primary assist on the Kopitar goal in the game against Florida. So those of you that want to see him putting up the physical numbers, uh, there you go with a point and an assist in that one. Uh, In the Lightning game, he didn't do much. um, And what he did do uh, kind of raised an eyebrow from me. I'll talk about that in a second. But one of the critiques I do have on Quentin Byfield, and it, it kind of popped up from the games over the weekend, is that sometimes he likes to wildly swing his stick in an attempt to knock the puck off of an opposing player's stick. And he's got a great reach, and it's something we definitely want to see him use to his advantage um, when he's getting his stick into passing lanes and into shooting lanes and and kind of trying to sweep the puck off of a player's stick. Um, But sometimes he does it very wildly and very noticeably. Uh, Sometimes it's one hand with a big sweep. Sometimes it's even two hands, kind of like almost like a chop. And when you're kind of big like him and you have a, a long stick and you're swinging it like that, it is very noticeable by the officials. And he's been called on penalties, tripping penalties, a few times when he does that long looping swing of his stick. And it happened again against the Florida Panthers. Um, Again, we want to see him use that reach and that uh, that long, long stick of his effectively um, when he's reaching out with it. Um, But I think there's better ways for him to do it than to have these big, long looping swings that really, like I said, is noticeable for officials. Um, There was also something late in the Tampa Bay game that, that again, raised my eyebrow. And I think most Kings fans are not going to agree with me on this. But about two and a half minutes to go in the game, uh, Tampa Bay standout defenseman Victor Hedman had the puck along the boards, was moving it, and Quentin Byfield took a shot on him and put him hard into the glass. Um, And there was no penalty on it. 
it got the ire of Victor Hedman because I don't think he was expecting to be hit in that situation. In the final moments of the game, he was kind of in a vulnerable position. And he went after Quentin Byfield, ended up actually getting a roughing penalty. Andre Kopitar had to step in between to protect QB uh, as he was going off onto the bench and Hedman was kind of going after him. Now, was it a penalty? No, it wasn't. Was Hedman eligible to be hit? He was. You could also argue he needs to, as use a boxing term, protect himself at all times. But I think one of the things I enjoy about hockey, even though it's a violent, sometimes nasty sport, there is still some respect with opponents in certain situations. And I don't know that Quentin Byfield showed that respect to a player who deserves it. Um, he Again, Victor Hedman was in a vulnerable position. It's a 5-2 game, late in the game, not really affecting anything. It appeared to me to be a hit out of frustration or the fact that Quentin Byfield thought, you know what, this guy is not expecting this. I can give him a shot and get away with it. Um, but I don't know that that was the right thing to do. And, and I only I only say that because I know, and I, I try to be fair, if somebody did that to Drew Doughty in a game that was pretty much decided in the final seconds when he was in a vulnerable position and they drove him into the boards like that with the potential of hurting him, that would have pissed me off. So I, again, I, I, I think most Kings fans are going to say, hey, I like to see Quentin Byfield showing some grit and some physical play in a game that was already decided. He's, you know, he's not going to just skate off and, and take it. He's going to show... You know, he got a he had, he had a chance to get a hit, and he was going to put a hit in. I get that argument, I really do, and I absolutely want to see Quentin Byfield be more physical and use his size. I just thought, honestly, that that was it was it was a little bit of a cheap shot. It was a hit that didn't need to be made. Certainly, did you know you when you see an opponent in a vulnerable position and you know that as a player, maybe you shouldn't do it, especially in a game that's that's not decided or that it's already been really decided against a player like that. If it was Corey Perry or uh, Matthew Kachuk, all bets are off with those a-holes. <laughs> they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. But I think Victor Hedman is a really respected guy. I think he plays the game the right way. Now he's a big guy. I'm sure, it, I mean, he can take the hit, but he certainly was not happy about it. And I thought he actually had good reason to be. So I, I just think if I'm Andre Kopitar after the game, I'd say, hey, Quentin, love to see you being physical, but just just think about, you know, doing things the right way. And I don't know. I don't know if that was the right way. It got, like I said, I want to be fair. If somebody did that to Drew Doughty, I'd be pissed off about it. So the fact that one of our, our guys did it to another player like that, eh, not sure that that was the best thing. But I, like I said, I think most Kings fans are going to very much disagree with me on that point. One more bad uh, to mention for the Kings is that the power play seems to have dried up. The Kings only had four power play chances in the two games, Friday and Saturday, but they were 0 for 4. And the Kings only have two power play goals in their last 17 man advantages. And they seem to be more and more missing Gabe Velarde and Arthur Kalia, both who are out injured on the power play specifically. Uh, that duo has combined for 11 power play goals on the season, and Kalia has seven of those, which still leads the team despite the fact that he has been out since December the 20th. And it's one of those things, it seems like when the power play is doing great, the penalty kill is not doing well. Now that the power play, or excuse me, now that the penalty kill is improving and playing better, now the power play is, has dipped. It would be great to see both those things uh, performing well at the same time, but it seems like that for the moment can't be the case for the LA Kings. So I think if we had our pick, we definitely would say have the better penalty kill because we have enough scoring five on five to be able to make up for maybe not getting those power play opportunities. Um, and we don't want to give up goals, uh, you know, on the, on the penalty kill. But like I said, it would be great to see them both operating at a high level. Right now, it seems like the power play is in a little bit of a slump. Hopefully, Gabe Velarde and Arthur Kalia, or one or both, will be able to come back soon after the All-Star break to uh, give uh, that power play a little bit of a, of a boost, especially Kalia. I mean, just a almost a power play specialist at this point. Uh, we need to crown a king, and I want to give you an update on some future kings, especially one that is probably the king's biggest prospect who had a big game over the weekend. But real quick, I need to remind you that today's episode of Locked on LA Kings is also brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL playoffs are here. Matter of fact, the Super Bowl is now set, and we are really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they are number one in the sports book in America, and that is FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, it's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers join today to get started with $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. 
FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to point spreads to player props. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a single game parlay, all on the app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. So football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet and get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. So it is uh, time to crown a king for the win on Friday. We started this um, recently where we're going to dish out a crown to a player who stood out in a king's victory and uh, got to give it up to one of the penalty killers uh, on behalf of the PK unit in the game against Florida, which did such an amazing job killing off six of those Panthers power plays and also scoring two shorthanded goals. This king had one of those shorthanded goals, also an assist, and he leads the Kings now with 20 goals on the year. It's the man they call Juice. Adrian Kempe gets the crown for the win over the Panthers. Long live the King. As we do each Monday, time to check in on the Pacific Division standings for the start of a new week. And did you see that the LA Kings were briefly in first place in the Pacific Division after Friday's win over the Panthers? More on that in a moment. Uh, but the Seattle Kraken are your first place team in the Pacific right now. 29, 15, and 5 of the record for 63 points. They are... Um, Right now, one point up on the Vegas Golden Knights and the LA Kings. They do have three games in hand on LA, and uh, they did beat the Columbus Blue Jackets last night. Vegas in second place uh, with a record of 29-18-4 for 62 points. Uh, they have lost four in a row. Uh, they lost uh, to the Islanders in overtime on Saturday. The Kings, again, 62 points tied with uh, the Vegas Golden Knights, but the Vegas Golden Knights have one more regulation win, so they get the tiebreaker right now that the Kings are in third, 28-18-6, and six, 62 points. The Edmonton Oilers, are 28, 18, and four with 60 points. They're two points back of the Kings for third place. They beat up on Chicago on Saturday, 7-3 in their last game. Uh, fifth place, Calgary kind of starting to fade, 24, 17, and nine for 57 points. The Vancouver Canucks are in sixth place. They made big news today, trading their captain, Bo Horvat, to the New York Islanders for a couple other players. Anthony Bavillier was one of them. Uh, Vancouver, 29, 26, and three for 43 points. San Jose, seventh place, 15, 25, and 11 for 41 points. And Anaheim, last place in the Pacific, 16, 29, and 5, 37 points, and they are very much in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes for the number one pick and the uh, the big prospect that is available in this year's NHL draft. I mentioned the Kings were briefly on top in the Pacific Division standings heading to Saturday's game against the Lightning, and I tweeted out a screenshot of the standings just for fun, and I had multiple comments about it, uh, but not what you might think. Every one of the comments that I saw talked about the Kings having a minus goal differential now, at the time the kings were a minus six in goal differential they're now at a minus nine after the tampa bay game which of course means they have allowed nine more goals than they've scored overall in the season the kings are the only team that have and they've been most of the season to have a negative goal differential and yet hold a playoff position actually there are three teams not in a playoff spot that have a positive goal differential so what does this mean? It certainly gets your attention when you look at the standings and you see that minus red number on the far right. But what does it mean? Should we care? And I think ultimately the answer is no. Um, would we rather trade places with, say, the Buffalo Sabres, who are a plus 20 in goal differential but aren't in a playoff spot? Of course not. Uh, now, I'm not saying I wouldn't prefer that the Kings on the season score more goals than they allow. But, you know, as long as we make the playoffs, I don't really care. Um, and what does this really say? Well, it says that the Kings win close games, and when they lose, they usually lose by two or more goals. On this road trip alone, the Kings' three wins over the Blackhawks, Flyers, and Panthers were all by one goal, and their two losses were a two-goal loss to Nashville and a three-goal loss to Tampa Bay. So just a small microcosm of, of what we're talking about. And I actually think, and I will admit I'm a uh, glasses-half-full kind of guy, but I actually think this might be a positive because the Kings know how to win close games. And those are the type of games you're going to be in typically in the playoffs. So maybe it's not that, that bad after all. I uh, want to do a quick check on some future Kings first to the AHL with the Ontario Reign. The Reign rolled over the San Diego goals on Saturday with a 7-2 win. Leas Anderson scored his team leading 18th and 19th goals of the season. Tyler Madden had a pair of goals as well, numbers 9 and 10 for him. Martin Chromiak continues to be red hot with his 8th goal of the season. His last uh, his first 11 games, Martin Chromiak, he had no goals and three assists. His last 13 games, all since the start of the new calendar year, 
He's got eight goals and five assists, so he's really turned it on of late, which is great to see. Uh, not to be forgotten is uh, rain captain TJ Tynan, who dished out four assists in that win on Saturday. Cal Peterson was in net, and he got the victory. Uh, he allowed two goals on 33 shots. Unfortunately, the rain lost on Sunday to the Calgary Wranglers by a score of 4-1. to one. Cal Peterson was again in net, but he actually only allowed two goals on 30 shots. The Wranglers had two goals into an empty net. And Leas Anderson, by the way, did score another goal in that one to give him 20 on the season, leading the Ontario Reign. And who knows? I know some people have talked about maybe calling it up to the Kings roster. I, I, I mentioned why that's probably not going to happen because he is not waiver exempt, but he could be putting himself into becoming a nice trade piece for the LA Kings at the deadline. Also want to tell you real quick about big time prospect Brant Clark had a hat trick for the Barry Colts in their 4-1 win over the Saginaw Spirit over the weekend. Um, now they all came in the third period and yes, two of them were empty net goals, but regardless, Brant Clark, uh, as expected doing very well in the OHL back with the Barry Colts, 10 goals, 10 assists in nine games for Brant Clark. Cannot wait to see him as a full-time King in the near future. All right. Looking ahead to what we have planned for you this week on Wednesday show, we'll recap the final game of the Kings six game road trip against the always tough Carolina hurricanes, which will be the final game before the all-star break Thursday, former LA King and current Kings radio analyst, Daryl Evans is going to rejoin us uh, and talk about the Kings season so far. And then we're going to have a feedback show on Friday, a feedback Friday. If you want to send an email on anything on your mind involving the LA Kings or this show, Please do so. Locked on Eddie at gmail.com. E D D I E. Locked on Eddie at gmail.com is the email address. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you always are welcome to leave your feedback on the episodes in the comment sections. Uh, please follow the show on Twitter. We're at Locked on LA Kings and on Instagram as well at Locked on LA Kings. Thank you for making Locked on LA Kings your first listen. Now make your second listen. Locked on NHL prospects, your daily prospect, uh, your daily podcast, I should say, covering the next generation of hockey superstars leading up to the NHL draft, plus NHL draft rankings and top prospect comparisons for every team that is locked on NHL prospects available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Eddie Garcia. Thank you for listening and watching this episode of Locked on LA Kings. Have yourself a great day. And as always, go Kings go.